Hi, this is Anthony Eppinger. I'm the host of the Think Neuro podcast here at Pacific Neuroscience Institute. And today I'm talking with Sharman McGraw. She started the Pituitary Patient Support Group under the direction of Dr. Dan Kelly. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, honey. yeah. So you have a, a pretty incredible story around um, pituitary disease. Let's Let's start there. Well, it's been a long journey. I started um, 20, well, my surgery was April 14th, 2000. So I've been advocating for patients for 22 years because I started basically right after my surgery. And I'm um, Dr. Kelly was my surgeon. And so I started fairly quickly after that, after I started feeling better um, working with Dr. Kelly and we had decided in the beginning that he was um, ready to start a pituitary patient support group. He saw a need for that and so did I. And so we um, collaborated and I have a co-facilitator, my good friend, Christina um, Robinson, and she had surgery with Dr. Kelly fairly uh, around the same time as me. She had a different type of tumor um, and so they inter we got introduced and have been like sisters ever since and have facilitated the support group, which is really the, it sounds, you know, oh great, a pituitary patient support group, but believe it or not, um, there is no other one in the country or in the, at, at all, that has lasted 21 years. Interesting. And, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience with a uh, pituitary disease when it, when did this come on? How did it manifest? And then how did you finally get a diagnosis and treatment? Yeah, that's a that's a really good um, question because it's a tricky it's a tricky diagnosis. I had Cushing's disease, and I started feeling. So tell tell us what that is. So Cushing's disease is a secondary disease to a pituitary tumor. Um, Cushing syndrome could be a combination of things: a, a, a steroid use. Um, uh, adrenal function, a tumor in the adrenals and different things. But Cushing's disease is specific to a tumor in the pituitary gland. So I, I was a size two, very athletic. This is a very common story, um, believe it or not, to the patients that I help now, where they were very athletic. We're all, you know, we weren't, um, you know, unhealthy people. Most of us had uh, thriving careers, athletic, living a normal life, what we thought was active and healthy. And I started feeling some, I think the first symptoms I really started feeling um, that made me stop and think something was wrong was um, anxiety. I had never really had anxiety like that. I, had, I wasn't a nervous person. Um, and so I would start to wake up in the like middle of the night with just kind of panic attacks. Interesting. So that kind of that threw up a red flag for me that there was something wrong. And then throughout the day, I would start to have these bursts of nervousness and not so much depression, but but a, a nervousness that was would linger almost all day with me. And so I'd stop drinking coffee or I would um, start noticing that that my heart would race. And so I ended up going to the doctor and they said, oh, you're allergic to caffeine. Hmm. And I said, why well, I've never been allergic to caffeine before. I've never heard of, I haven't heard of many people being, being allergic, allergic to, to caffeine. caffeine. So they said, stop drinking it. I'm like, okay, then that, that, all right, I'll try it. Why not? So didn't help, obviously it didn't help. And things started getting worse. Now I started gaining, I was a size two. I wore um, petite size, you know, clothes. Uh, people, friends would ask me to go to the gym and show them, you know, mm. my workout. What did you do? Had thick, long blonde hair. How I, old are you at this point? I was, at that point, I was in my 30s. Okay. So. Um, living in LA. Living, or? I was actually living in Newport, but okay. my. My friends were in LA in the Hollywood scene, you know, and where I always like to say where anorexia is a compliment, not a disease. <laughs> so you don't sit, you know, so mm. when you, you're conscious where I live about appearance, I was an interior designer, everything, you know, in Newport beach and LA is about looks and things like that. And, 
you know, I had been a flight attendant. I had, at the time I was a flight attendant, I had 50 pounds I could have gained before I would have went on weight restriction. I had no problem with that. You know, I didn't, I, I, so there was no concern about my weight. And um, in fact, at one time I had seen therapists younger years on at being borderline anorexic. Mm. So I start putting on a little weight with this anxiety. The weight comes on, a couple pounds here, a couple pounds there, but I'm still at the gym five days a week, doing aerobics three hours a day. My diet has not changed. Nothing has changed except for this first symptom, anxiety, then the second little weight gain. So I go to the doctor again and I say, now I've gained five pounds, I've gained six pounds. And, and then the doctor, I'll never forget, goes, well, you're too thin. You're in your 30s. You can't stay that tiny forever. And I'm like, but that's not a diagnosis. Mm. That's that's not that doesn't make sense to me. I, I have friends that are having babies. They come right back to the same size. You know, I, I don't understand why the weight is coming on so quickly. You know, because so, it was a period of how long um, I would gain at one point. I gained 11 pounds in four days. What? Yeah. So I had a job interview. I'll never forget. I had a job interview coming up for an interior design job. And I had gotten um, like a, a red double-breasted long uh, gabardine dress. And it had fit me just perfect. And the interview was in four days and I couldn't button it by the time I got, I was, it was time to go to the interview. And I had gained 11 pounds. And I went to the doctor and I said, I've just gained 11 pounds in four days. And they're like, well, that's impossible. It's just water retention. And I said, I understand it seems impossible. I'm not retaining water. This is something's going on medically. And then I started to get a red rash that kind of just covered my face where makeup couldn't hide it much. Um, I remember in the early stages when the anxiety was getting worse, the weight gain was getting worse. My hair started changing. I had really thick hair. Like for a blonde, I had, you could only take the rubber band around it twice, you know, mm. like, Rrr! and friends would like touch your hair and go, I mean, I would, I did a modeling thing for my hair. I was like, this magazine was the back of my hair because it was so thick. And um, I was walking in, I remember walking into um, a health food store down in Orange County and a friend of mine who hadn't seen me in a few months, who's one of my very best friends, she had been out of town. She sees me and she runs up and she grabs the back of my ponytail and she's like, Charmy. And the her face said it all. Like we both just burst into tears because it was kind of the first person that made me realize when she saw me, how much I had actually changed mm. in such a short period of time. Like my, I was trying to wrap my head around it, but I could kind of hide, like I'm going to the doctor, what's yeah, going yeah. on? You know, I'm not sure about this. But when she saw me, she literally, we both burst into tears. And I said, she's like, what's going on with you? I said, I'm really sick. So we sat down and I remember her going, your hair, what's wrong? What, what is this? And I said, I don't know. Had it, had it changed its it, texture it was, or? The texture, it had fell out so much that it was like half of the hair oh my. that I had actually had before. And that just the structure of my face started, was so different that when a normal person gains weight, it kind of just goes over and, you know, you may go, oh, she put on a few pounds or something, but you don't, you're not shocked at the way their face changes. And the moon face is one of the main characteristics of a uh, Cushing's patient, where if you've ever seen anyone on steroids that's had to be on, like, or chemos, where their their face balloons out to red and balloons out, that's that was pretty much what my face looked like and it with this red rash and it was just my cheeks and the whole appearance just looked different. My eyes looked different. They started yellowing. And, um, and so when Lori, my friend that I ran into at the store really forced me to say, I got to take this serious. I can't mess around anymore. These doctors can't just keep telling me, you know, the same old thing. So I thought, well, maybe I need to go to a woman doctor. Maybe there's something. So the first thing she said is, well, yeah, your hormones, you're probably starting perimenopause. And I'm like, in my 30s? In your 30s, that's Like, early. that just seems yeah. so early. And so she's like, well, it happens. So, and you're depressed. And I said, I don't feel depressed. I feel 
upset and angry that this is happening and I'm not getting answers, but I'm definitely not a depressed person. So she said, well, you're going to have to go on antidepressants and that will help. It'll help with the weight gain. And, you know, this is back in like 2000, uh, 1997, 98 or yeah. whatever, 93. It was when it started. Oh, this is 93. 93. Okay. 1993. And so I said, okay, so you trust. I mean, we're, we were raised to trust our doctors. That's what they're there for, you know. So I go and I, I start this antidepressant against my better judgment. But I'm thinking, well, maybe I could just do it for a few months. Maybe that's what it does. And it just levels something out. So the weight piled on mm. at that point. So then I couldn't sleep at all. The anxiety was so bad at night that I would fall asleep okay, but within... No, like maybe I'd sleep for 20 minutes and I just wake up in a sweat and just anxiety to the point where I had to walk the floor and walk the floor and walk the floor. And then my fear is like, what is, what the hell is going on that I'm, so, that am I going to die? Like, are they going to miss this till I'm dead? And so... Then I went to another doctor and I told him, so I went back to the woman doctor and she's like, yeah, you're just, that's just normal. Are all of these doctors at this point just internists? Yeah, um, at this point they're internists. You haven't, or, got, you haven't specialized. You haven't, not to an okay. endocrinologist yet because I have no idea. Don't it's in my, I right, don't have right. no idea what an endocrinologist yeah, is, is opposed to a general doctor. Mm. So she would, the doctor I went to not only was a GP, but she also was a, a gynecologist. So I thought, okay, well, she should know something. And then, so she said, well, I really just think you just have to watch your diet and eat better. And that was her answer. And then I, so I went to a man and I thought, okay, well, maybe I'm going to get somewhere because this is way, this is really getting worse. Now I'm up over 25 pounds at You've this gained. point. I had gained. So now I went from a size two to a size like 12, 10 or 10, about a size 10. But So I'm not obese at this point. So, so he says, so the doctor says, well, you're not bad. And I said, but what happened to you're too thin? Okay. Yeah. And what happened and because this happened so quickly? Quickly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and that's it, just, yeah. it, it was like, I kept saying, I, nothing's changed. Like, there's like, well, you know, women just have this happen. This is the way it is for women. And I'm thinking, huh? I've been a woman my whole, you know, all these years I have sisters, I have, I have best friends, I have you know, I was a flight attendant. I I am around women all the time. I think we would talk about that. We talk about everything. And this is not a topic any of us Nobody have ever else had to talk about this. this, you know. And so then I start hiding from people because now I'm embarrassed to even go out because everyone's kind of like, well, what the hell is going on with her? So then this doctor puts me on another antidepressant because I can't sleep at night. So this one's for night and this one's for day. And I'm like, <sighs> I don't feel good about that at all. So then I go to an, I finally go to an endocrinologist and he just starts me on a, this bad journey of like, I need you on kidney medicine. You're retaining fluid. You're pre, um, he called it, you're burning out your adrenal glands. You're, so now he has me just spinning because I don't know what the heck is going on. So I had to call him like every Monday and tell him what my blood sugars were at. And he would test, um, but he never tested my cortisol. But he tested like blood sugar and all this stuff and saying you're burning out your adrenal glands. And, but nobody ever did the main test to really figure out what hormones were out of whack. So they were testing like thyroid or, um, you know, estrogen levels, but nobody knew enough about the endocrine system to really give me a good idea that my hormones were truly off or not. So, so all this time, I have no idea um, what's really going on. You know, I have to trust that they do, but at this point, I don't. So this evolves over seven years where I had CAT seven scans years. and MRIs and um, just uh, cardio, you know, heart things. And yeah, this went on for seven years and I'd end up in the emergency room with an anxiety, with the anxiety. And they'd tell me, well, that's because you're having a panic attack. And I said, no, I'm not. This is something else. And then 
the, the, then they would see that I was on antidepressants. They're like, well, you're yeah. on antidepressants. So maybe. And I said, uh, so finally they kept, everything kept revolving around what another doctor would say or, but no one would ever give me a clear answer. And so finally I said, no more, no more drugs. I, so I stopped the antidepressants. I stopped the sleep thing. And I went, and I remember having a panic attack and going into the ER and they said to me, um, well, we called your, so they, they saw that I stopped the, the antidepressants. Mm. And so they went and called my doctor and he said, I can't help her anymore. She refuses to listen to what I'm saying. She, you know, I didn't tell her to get off the antidepressants. And I said, no, but when I was in his office last, he, everything I told him, he said were the antidepressants. So I can't win, you, you know? No. So then you're in a loop. I, I was in a, the spinning yeah. out of control loop. So Finally, I just said to myself after all, I knew I was dying. I mean, at this point, I had already gained 100 pounds in one year. I went from a size 2 to a size 22, size 24 at my biggest. Um, I had to wear maternity clothes because my stomach went out 54 inches. I had my one of my best friends, Karen, had, had just had a baby. And so she gave me she was a businesswoman. So she gave me her maternity clothes so at least I could go to work. Oh my gosh. Um, it, I remember being at my gynecologist's office for my annual and she looked at, and I was sitting in there with all the other, with the pregnant women, which is not their fault. I was in a gynecology yeah. with pregnant women. And I remember one of them saying, so when is your baby due? And uh. it's not her fault, but I just remember breaking into tears and telling her, it's not your fault. I'm not pregnant. I'm sick. There's something wrong with me. And we don't know what. And she said, and she started crying because she's like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And so then I go in. So now I'm already emotional. I'm already on the verge of having a nervous breakdown because of the way I look. I know I'm sick. Sure. My hair at this point now, I've had to cut it short because it's so fine and oily. And the my skin had just became so oily and the, the, the red couldn't be covered up anymore. Um, and so when I looked in the mirror, I did not see myself anymore at all, nor did any of my friends. And so now they're thinking, now it's so funny. So the one, same people that used to ask me to go to the gym with them now are saying, giving me suggestions on diet. Like I've lost my mind. Like I have am, amnesia. Um, like I'm gaining weight. I don't have amnesia. I know how to eat. I know what it, I know my diet. I know my lifestyle. There's something medically wrong with me. But of course, doctors are insisting there's not. So even at the time, one of my dearest friends, um, you know, she was an actress in Hollywood and everything. She didn't believe there was anything medically wrong with me. And we really, it really put a strain on our friendship. I had to stop really seeing her because I remember getting a phone call from her screaming at me one day saying, I'll pay for it. I'll get you, go to see a nutritionist. You're killing yourself. And I had to stop her. And I said, you can't talk to me that way anymore. No. I'm really sick. And she's like, doctors are telling you there's nothing wrong with you. I said, well, I'm going to go to the doctors that find what's wrong because I'm not going to die this way. I don't care if I die at this point, but I will not let my obituary read, obese woman dies of unknown causes. I didn't do this to myself. And that kind of was not the end of that friendship, but a damper. Mm. I have my other best friend, the one that I'm still best friends with to this day since we were, you know, 18 years old. She was on the opposite scale because she knew like my lifestyle. We were, we it looked so much alike when we were young that people used to stop us and think we were one another. She had had three kids. Her body hadn't changed, you know, much. I mean, a little like a like women do, but uh, normal. So when she would see me, she'd tell me, Charmy, mm. don't give up. There's something wrong. Don't give up. You just need to go to another doctor. Find another one if that one doesn't work. You don't give up. I know this isn't you. So luckily I had you, but that's what we have. We have these kind of scale when yeah. we're sick, you know? So then I go, I'm back at the end, the, the OBGYN for my annual. This doctor walks in and I'm already on the verge of tears. And she says to me, she looks at my chart and she goes, oh, oh, Charmin, you've gained like 50 pounds. And I'm looking at her like, right. So I'm thinking, right, yeah. so help me. So what are we going to do? 
How do we fix this? And she goes, oh, that's not good. And your blood sugar is getting higher too. I said, well, I've been seeing this endocrinologist and this, and we can't get to the bottom of it when, and she's like, okay, well, good luck. You're kidding me. She walked out the door. I'm not kidding you. That was her words. And she goes, well, good luck. Oh my gosh. And I remember being in her office. I couldn't leave. I was so hysterical that the girl had to come in from the desk and said, we need this room. And I said, I'm going to die and nobody is hearing me. And I just walked out. And oh. it was so, I knew at that point that it was going to be up to me to figure this out. So finally, I didn't have a computer at that point, but I had friends that did because this was way back when we had dial up and we, you know, I, mm. computers were fairly new. And so I, I had went over, I had got as many of my medical records as I could get my hands on. And I started researching and researching what is a common denominator? What has gone, what has changed in my lab work? What lab work have they done? You know, and finally, I had even went up to a very, I will not, not name them by name, but they're in Santa Barbara, very well-known uh, clinic. That's kind of like a Mayo clinic that sees patients, you know, with multiple mm. doctors. And I had, I had talked to them before I went and they assured me, we have multiple doctors. They will test you. They will get to the bottom of this. Absolutely. I go, I, you know, I drive up to Santa Barbara. I take off work. I get a hotel. I go see the team of doctors, the first one. And literally the first day, they told me there was nothing wrong with me. They did no testing. But the one thing they said is they had, they gave me a report that said, um, they ruled out Cushing's disease. And I didn't know what that was, but it was This written. is the first time you this heard This is the first word. time I've ever heard the okay. word. We rule, she looks cushionoid or something like that, it said, but because her eyes were clear and her mouth didn't have sores in them, we've ruled out Cushing's disease. So I get this report at the end of the day and I'm waiting and I start crying hysterical in this doctor's like facility where I was at. And I said to them, I said, I was told I'd be here three days that you guys would make me appointments with several doctors based on what the other doctors say and that we would get to the end of the, to the resolve this. And they said, well, let me ask the doctor. So the two doctors that I had seen, they, they got me on the phone. There was like a wall phone and they said, well, I mean, if that's what you want then we can maybe have you see, see a rheumatologist because your joints hurt and you can't sleep. I can, you can see like a, a, a internist. And I said, no, this is not what I want. This is what I have to have. I, I'm dying. I, there's something seriously wrong with me. You did nothing. I drove all the way here and you, I could have done that in Orange County. I mean, I saw two doctors that just went over some standardized test, blood test. And, and checked my skin, you know, I mean, yeah. and so they said, okay, well, why don't you come back tomorrow? And we'll see what we, you know, we'll put you with a couple different doctors. And it was to pacify me, not to help right, me. Right. And so I did. I went the next day to a, a Now, are you paying for this out yes, of pocket? Yes, out of pocket. Mm -hmm. For this, out of pocket, this all of it. high end, supposedly comprehensive um, uh, yes, evaluation. Test and everything, like okay. hotels, everything. All, 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 every dime I had up to this point went for medical insurance and to uh, pay for doctor bills. And, and and not one doctor is accountable. Only the patient. You know, like you can make the mistake, but the patient has to pay for it. So I go up. And they go the next day and I see a rheumatologist and he's like, "Yeah, I want you to see a fibromyalgia support group." And I'm like the heck yeah you know here, one it. more thing on the list and then this doctor says well you've got GERDs you know anti I don't go on antacids I mean mm. and I'm like again so I read again what they write rule out Cushing's okay well one thing then I know I don't have is this Cushing's thing whatever this might be so then I go back to Orange County see a few more doctors another one says to me I want you to go on the fin fins the diet pills well I go on them and they almost kill me because I'm already full of anxiety and they cost so oh, much. Yeah. Like I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown. That's so like, I tell they're that. basically speed. Exactly. 
So I tell him, I can't go on that. That thing's, those are going to kill me. Yeah. So he's like, ah, there's nothing I can do then. You don't want to help yourself. So then I, so I said, so I told him off because at this point now I'm at the point where I got it. I can't waste time with these kind of people. I can't be nice anymore. I can't worry about their feelings. I have to focus on who is going to get to the bottom of this with me, you know, and give me my life back or let me die. That's fine. But somebody has to figure it out. So someone else doesn't die from it, mm. you know? So, um, so at that point I had, was fed up. I, I started getting the medical records and everything like that. And the same doctor that put me on the FinFin had ran one blood test. And he, I remember he came in and he had tested my cortisol level for the first is time. The, this is the first this is time. This is the first time out of all these in doctors. In how many years now? Seven. Wow. That anybody tests my cortisol level, but he only did it in the blood. But so he says. As opposed to where? The urine. Oh, which it, is the gold different. standard. It is. That's interesting. The gold standard okay. is the urine. Okay. Uh, now saliva testing too, but in those days, so he tests my. So I didn't know what he was talking about, but and he we came should, in. Cortisol is. Cortisol is made in your adrenal glands, but it's it's signaled from your pituitary gland. So your pituitary gland creates um, adrenal corticotropic hormone, your ACTH, and your ACTH from the pituitary talks to your adrenal glands. And your adrenal glands then make your life-sustaining hormone cortisol. And now that's kind of a buzzword. Everybody knows what cortisol is because they're like, oh, high cortisol, low cortisol. Yeah. You know? But in those and days, it's a, I mean, it, it, don't it's, people think about it as a stress hormone? Yes. It's what your body it's your secretes. It's your fight or when flight it, hormone. Yeah. Yep. When you're stressed or in danger or... Exactly. And it prepares your body for... Fight or flight. Yeah. Okay. And it's... And it's it a great thing your, in small quantities. Right. And okay. in the appropriate quantities right. because... When you need it to be high, if you're in a stressful situation, it will go high. Yeah. Because that's what it's meant to do. When you're running it's not from supposed, like a cougar or... <laughs> right. A, if you're going to be eaten by a tiger. Yeah. Right. But if you're not in a stressful situation, in normal switch situations, even a little bit of stress, your, your cortisol level will go back to, to normal mm -hmm. usually. Quickly. Um, yeah, quickly. Fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it is a life-sustaining hormone. So you have to have cortisol or you will die. And that's one thing that we don't teach enough about is if the pituitary gland stops working properly, it's just like our heart, you know? I mean, you usually typically don't die as fast if your heart stops, but if your pituitary gland is not working properly, eventually you you will lose all your hormonal function. Well, it is, I mean, they call it the master gland, For right? A because it controls other glands. It and controls it's sort your of, uh, endocrine system, yeah. right? I mean, it is, and it, and it's how big? It's the size about the top of your um, thumbnail. Yeah, yeah. So a large, right between your two like a lima bean or something, right? Yeah, little, and this tiny little thing is so powerful. Is so, and that's a little scary that we invest all that <laughs> into in this, this tiny little, little, little gland. tiny structure. But anyway, but it's very so you, hardy. Our it's hardy. It's okay. very hardy okay. gland, and it's buried deep in your head. It is between your two optic nerves and your uh, optic chiasms, and your so it sits at the base of your brain. So yeah. it's really not a brain uh, uh, in your brain. Um, it is considered brain surgery, but it is a skull base tumor. Yeah, and it's and it's um, but mid it's, some very high it's, it's, price it, real estate in there. It right? is, yeah. Some there's important some, stuff. Some very okay. important. All right, so you, get the, so you get the so, cortisol test. So I get the cortisol, and he, I remember he came in, this doctor came in to me, and he said, wow, either you're really sick or this test was done wrong. So I have a lab, he owned the lab, in Huntington Beach. I want you to retest it there. So I'm like, okay, maybe we're getting somewhere. Yeah. So I go to the lab, I bring the lab slip, I get the test, I come back. I call the, you know, I call the doctor again. The nurse gets on the line. She's like, yep, all of everything was normal. No. And I said, no. what? Well, until I went back and started investigating myself, the test that was high, the cortisol, wasn't retested on the second one. And the doctor that, that had sent me there originally never questioned, never realized. So they tested had, something else? They just, they, they might have tested it, but the results never came back. So, so she was so reading the first she one. She was still. reading, she was reading what came back and the cortisol wasn't in the group okay. and the group, I saw it on the test when they did it, but the lab never returned the results and the doctor never questioned it. I didn't know enough to question it. Now that's why I tell patients now, like patients will go, oh, they've tested everything. And I say, that means nothing to me. I want to see what they tested. 
you know, because they don't, and then I'll look at it and it's just normal lab work. Like doctors, it's nothing. It's, nothing. it's, it's not telling them so you, anything. So you take a baby so, step forward here and, and then, then a huge step the back. door shuts again. But that was where I figured out that when, so when I went to my second appointment, the back to the follow-up appointment, he's like, yep, I told you nothing's medically wrong with you. You just need to eat less and diet more. And I was like, oh my gosh. and I told him off that day. I really did. I mean, I, I probably shouldn't have talked to him the way I did, but at that point I didn't have time for that kind of stuff. He didn't do his job. And now that I know, seeing the results of what he didn't do, yeah. you know, he didn't do his job basically. And then, so when I started following up and reading all the transcripts and everything like that from doctors, I started putting pieces together. And at that point I went to a, so this one thing, this Cushing's, this cortisol, yeah. this, you know, um, small clues, but clues nevertheless. So I went to a friend's house and I said, I need to borrow your computer. And I put in, we didn't have a Google in those days. No, it was like, you know, a, it was like Alta some Vista or yeah, some, some crazy <laughs> come dial, you know. And so um, I put in cortisol and I had put it in one other time and something about trout and fish. And I'm like, huh? Like, because mm. now I know fish and animals can get Cushing's disease. So, um, so I put it in again at Pat, at my friend Pat's house and up comes this article from the Pituitary Network Association, still an advocate group that I still work with today, but I didn't know them and then, but I look at it and it says Cushing's disease. And I'm like, well, there's that name again. Yeah. So I start reading the symptoms and I just get oh my like, my heart's racing. I'm crying. I'm like, I, I, they missed it. it. They missed it. This is it. And another endocrinologist that I had been seeing had at the very first meeting said, I think I know what's wrong with you, but I need to do some tests. Um, I maybe need to do a brain scan. And I and I looked at him like, I go, brain scan, it's either in my stomach. My stomach's what's big, not my brain. I never have a headache. And he said, no, no, it's, it, there's, there's a disease that, you, you know, I'm going to check it out. Well, that endocrinologist had ended up taking my thyroid out because I had all these nodules on my thyroid. And when I went back to him, I said, okay, so now let's work. Now, what's this other brain scan thing you needed to do? And he goes, nah, I'm not going to test you on that. You don't have it. You, so you had your, when did you have your thyroid removed? That was in 1998. Was that, was that completely separate? Well, yeah, we assume it is because a lot of women have thyroid disease. Yeah, yeah. It could have been part of it, the fact that I had hormonal issues, but it's not something we really know. But, but you know, I needed it out just the same. Okay, but it, but it obviously it didn't solve... It didn't solve the, the other problems. problem. Right, okay. But that endocrinologist, I had waited six months to see. He's the He was one of the top guys in Newport Beach. And he really should have known the minute I walked in his office, I was the poster child for um, Cushing's disease. And I remember being in his office when he first said it, and I was so excited. I had told my friends, I think this doctor's gonna get to the bottom of it. And Karen was like, oh my God, thank God. I've heard good things about him, you know? And I'm like, yes, he's like one of the top endos here. And so when I went back after the thyroid, I was so hopeful that this is it. We're gonna now get to the mm. bottom of the real issue. And I'll never forget in his office and saying, okay, now what? What's our next step to figure this out? Because then, by then, I had went to the GP and the GP had ran cortisol because now I'm researching myself. And the GP, I'd asked, I said, I think um, I need this cortisol thing checked and all this. So my cortisol in my urine was, the, the cutoff was 100. And um, normal is 100. Normal, the normal was 10 to 100. 10 to 100, yeah. So mine was 200 and something. Oh my God. So I brought in the results. I had done it twice. So I had brought in the results to the endocrinologist after the thyroid thing. And I said, here's this test. What does this mean? And he said, well, yeah, I mean, that's high. But oh, it, uh, obesity causes high cortisol. Oh this is an endocrinologist. Gosh. And I said, okay, well, first this was high. Then I became obese. Like, you know, I'm trying to do all the track, yeah. you know, putting the pieces together. And he's like, well, you know, I, 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 I think you're good. Let's just see you in a few months. And I was like, wait, what? Wait a second. What? 
I see, and I remember this specifically. I was sing, sitting in the in the exam room. There was a pharmaceutical rep like doing whatever in the hallway. And she kept giving me the look like because the door was open. Oh my God. And he said, and I said, no, I cannot deal with this any longer. I said, something is wrong with me. And I believe this cortisol has to is the key. You had said you were going to do a brain scan. I need that brain scan. I think I have Cushing's disease. And he said to me, and I not exaggerating this, he put his finger to my face and said, do not tell me how to diagnose you. And then I will never forget the rep caught my eye like this. Her eyes got really big. And I looked at him back and I said, no, do not tell me how to manage my health. And he stopped and I said, you don't have to help me, but someone is going to help me and I am going to get help. What are the names of the doctors at UCLA that you had said originally that maybe you would send me to? I want their names immediately. And he said, fine, let them have something to do. And he gave me the script. So the other, so they, so my GP then at the time ran an MRI and he said, I, if, if this doctor, if your endocrinologist says you don't have it, then you don't have it. You need to move on. I said, just write me the script for the MRI and be done with me. But that's what I need. So he said, yeah, okay, well, I'll do it. So he did the MRI. The MRI came back negative, but I had already been researching to figure out that 30% of ACTH producing tumors, because you know, were too small to be seen yeah. on the MRI. They're very it's small. It's already a in lot a small, I mean. Yes, and they're very structure. deadly, but very small. When the MRI came back negative, I said, fine. Now, now when I, and I'd already made an appointment at, with UCLA and it took me two months to get in. And at the time, um, Dr. Kelly was working there at, at UCLA. So I waited the two months. I got in and... The, that must have been excruciating. It waiting. was... Wait, the I mean, wait all these was, waits. All and these at the waits. time, I'm reading and reading whatever yeah. I can get my hands on, which was very limited information. I was going to say, was, what was the public awareness of Not pushings? much I mean, at it wasn't all. even... It doesn't sound like the medical establishment was that aware no, of it. No, no, okay. not at all. Okay. It, very little information. It was considered highly, highly rare. Nobody's going to see that in their career, doctors, you know... And so my brain, now I'm reading this thinking, if I could diagnose it on the internet, maybe <laughs> I don't have it. Like, how could that be? Like, how could it be so rare and I have it? Like, you yeah. know, so now I'm starting to be skeptical myself. Like, you know, but I, but something inside just tells me, just keep going, keep going. So I get into the appointment at UCLA and in walks Dr. Uh, Van Hurley at the time, who was training my endocrinologist to this day, Dr. Cohan was doing his fellowship with him at the time. And he walks in, shakes my hand, and he said, so you're here because you have Cushing's? Oh my gosh. And my heart oh just my. shot, I stopped, and he had fellows in there and things like that. And I said, I do, right? He said, he's looking through my lab work. He's like, well, your lab work says yes. And what took you so long to get here? Oh my God. And I just started crying. Oh. I said, oh my God. Because this is how I'm many years? How many years at this years. point? This is seven the end of years. seven years. And now a message from our sponsor. The Think Neuro Podcast is brought to you by Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. If you're inspired by what you hear and wish to support our mission of education through innovation, please visit pacificneuro.org slash foundation. And most patients, you know, I feel for, like I've done talks for the American Brain Tumor Association and, and a lot of different things. And I hear these stories of these poor patients with brain tumors and it's the worst day of their life. They get a diagnosis of this brain tumor. And I think what an opposite ironic situation when a pituitary patient gets diagnosed, they're actually relieved. Well, yeah. They're actually you have relieved. An answer. How sad is that? That they've had such a horrible journey and felt so sick that by the time the, the good they news is get this to the diagnosis, diagnosis is that they have a pituitary tumor. It met it's screwed up, you know. Yeah. But we are. We're relieved because we're not crazy. There, and I feel like you know, like if you know what it is, you can fight it. 
if you don't know what it is, you can't fight it. No, you're in the dark. How are you going to get well if yeah. you can't if you can't even get to the devil that's doing it? You know. So Dr. Van Hurley looked at um, the, his fellows and he said, "Listen to your patient. They're telling you the they're telling you the diagnoses." He said. Look at her, just because I brought pictures and I brought all these things to show him, like, the progression. Mm. So he was like, look at her. This is the progression. Yeah. She's the poster child. Textbook. S textbook case. So all the other doctors that I would go see, I'd bring pictures. And I said, see this? This is what I looked like. And one of them had the nerve to say to me, oh, well, you are really pretty. I said, I'm not here for a beauty contest. Oh. I'm not here to win a beauty contest. I'm here to get well. So... All these, my story is not different than probably 90% of the patients that I advocate with and that I've met through this journey. They've described the, the same. The exact story. And what is so disheartening is so many patients aren't like me where I was like, oh, hell no. I, I will. I, I don't care if I die, but you're not going to win. I'm going to win. Somebody's going to know that somebody else has this disease. They're going to, it's going to help somebody else. So other patients have what like, they've given up? Or? A lot of patients. Yeah. I have a patient right now that just sent me an email because um, I get a lot of, I have a lot of contact with a lot of patients. But anyway, one of them just told me that I, I've been so mistreated along this journey. I don't know that I can talk because I've recommended cheesy Dr. Cohan. And my endocrinologist, who is the most kind, loving, caring, brilliant endocrinologist there is, treats everyone with such respect, doesn't care who you are, you're going to have respect. He knows the journey that the patients have gone through. He knows the mistakes his colleagues make. He's not going to, you're not going to tell him anything that he hasn't heard before that, you know, that a doctor has missed or, or poo pooed mm. or ignored or anything like that. So this patient that just emailed me, I said, you know, she said, I don't, I, I shut down now when I see doctors because it's not worth the humiliation that they make me feel. When I'm telling them these symptoms, they just make me feel more insane. So, you know, mm. I have to have a conversation with her to let her know that when I recommend Dr. Cohan, he's not going to treat you he's that way. So, so come back to... At some point, you meet Dr. Kelly. Yes. Yeah, so then... Is, is he the next step? He's the next step. So luckily, at the time, there's a little good old boys club going on, at, you, you know, with a lot of university hospitals. Um, it's a known. I'm not saying anything out of turn. Um, of course, it's a little, you know, so Dr. Van Hurley had been in, you know, an endocrinologist for 40 years or more or whatever. And he says to me, I... I want you to see Dr. Dan Kelly. And I said, okay, I have, I, you know, he said to me, there's another more senior. Because Dr. Kelly at the time, you got to remember, is like 40 yeah, years old. Yeah, He's this a... young guy in for a neurosurgeon yeah. that is so pronounced, yeah. you know. And he was at the time, he was the director of the pituitary endocrine uh, uh, department at UCLA and been there for several years doing pituitary surgery. And, but he was young and there was a senior surgeon at the time. He's not there now. Um, but uh, Dr. Van Hurley said, Dr. Kelly is young. And he said, but he's brilliant. And he's the one you need to see. And I said, okay, I trust that. Well, ironically, at the time I was doing interior design and I think the journey was all meant to be because at the time I was doing interior design, one of my clients was a former UCLA uh, neurosurgeon. Oh my gosh. He had retired. He was an older man. And I said to him, I went to him and I said, and he still kept up. He's still in an yeah. office at UCLA and still on staff there and everything. And I told him the story. I said, I think I have Cushing's disease. And uh, he said, then you're with the right. I said, if out of every, I can go anywhere. My insurance will cover anywhere. And he said, no, Dan Kelly will make history. He's mm. the guy that is young. And I'm still, I don't know how old he is. I know nothing about him. So I'm like, how young is this guy? Everyone keeps saying he's young, but I guess compared to, you know, this the guy I was, my client and all this, he was young compared to that because he was in his seventies, you know, whatever. And here's this young guy. So he said, Dan Kelly is the guy that we watch. 
because what he's doing now, we didn't even have a clue in our day. Wow. You know, he said, so he will be the one that we that new doctors will read about in medical books. That's who he is. And this is what year? This is in two, uh, 1999 then, the very end, towards the end of 1999. Okay. So Dr. Uh, Van Hurley sets me up to, to go to, to have a... Um, uh, the next test that I needed, I needed like, a, I think it was the protossal sinus sampling or something. Oh no, at this point he wants me to meet Dr. Kelly. That's what it was. So uh, so this is a great story. So this is the kind of guy that Dr. Kelly is and why I absolutely love him like my family and that we became such good friends after my surgery because I had been mistreated so mm. long. I wasn't going to put up with anything anyway, but I needed a surgeon that was going to care about me. I, for me to go on and advocate and help thousands of people, I, and at that point, I just wanted my life back. I didn't think I'd ever help anybody. All I knew is, okay, I'm going to get my life back and I'm going to live my life. But I needed someone to care about me. And so I go and I have an appointment with Dr. Kelly. It was very difficult for me to get off work. And so um, I made this appointment. I needed, you know, it was a lot of work to get to it. And I come home at 11 o'clock at night after seeing client after client. And I have a, a, a voicemail on my answering machine in those days in 1999. Oh, yeah. And it's Dr. Kelly's office at the time. And they said, Dr. Kelly had to have a change in his schedule. And he can't see you for a couple of weeks. Um, uh, he's going on vacation out of the country, but as soon as he gets back and I, he's, cause he's going to have surgery tomorrow, we might be able to see you late in the afternoon, but I'm in Orange County and I can't just drive up if they could see me mm. kind of thing. So I'm hysterical because now I think, here we go again. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to, mm -hmm. no one's really going to help me. No one's ever going to help me. Mm. And this guy probably doesn't even care that it's like, you know, he, he doesn't think I'm serious. You're not taking me serious. So Something inside of me said, go to that appointment in the morning that they canceled. And so I go, I pack my little things. I get up at the crack of dawn. It, I'll never forget. I set my alarm because I had to be at the, uh, I said, I'm just going to get there when his office opens. Yeah. And just and sit there. Just sit there. Yeah. And so I go, I remember get, it was the foggiest day I've ever driven in. I get, I, I'm determined and I get to UCLA. I had a little pillow. I sleep in my car for a few minutes oh my God. and then I go in. And if you can imagine a university hospital is not like this beautiful hospital that he's in now and all where people are like friendly. This is a massive in and out. And, you know, nobody really knows that what anybody's doing. I mean, it's a huge huge institution. And I go into the neurosurgery building. I go down to the basement and, and they look at me and they go, can I help you? And I said, I'm here to see Dr. Kelly. And they said, do you have an appointment? And I said, no. And they're like, okay. I said, but I know if you call him and let him know I'm here, I know he'll see me. And they said, it doesn't work that way. And I said, please listen to me. Mm. I have, I know he'll see me. And they go, okay. So they let me oh. sit there and they'd roll their eyes and everybody'd go, what's she waiting yeah. for? And I, and they're like, oh, she's going to see Dr. Kelly without an appointment. And I, and I'm sitting there going, please call him, please call him. So finally, one of them knows I'm not leaving. So they, his office, the girl at the time, ran totally different than now, um, calls in and said, and they said, yeah, this woman's here. She says she'll, he'll see her. They hang up the phone and five minutes, the phone rings and they, their eyes get big and they're like, yes, Dr. Kelly. Okay. Dr. Kelly, thank you. And they hang up and they're like, um, Ms. He's McGraw, gonna... Dr. Kelly said, um, he'll be here in five minutes. And I said, yeah, that's what I thought. So anyway, I go in the office. He comes in fully in scrubs. His at the time they have a pager, you know, and um, and he he looks sits down. And I said, I'm so sorry to do this to you. I know I'll hurry. You're going. You need to go into surgery. And he said, No, we're not going to hurry. They can't start without me. Mm. And I start crying. And he looks at me and he says, I'll never forget. He said, What took you so long to get here? Oh. And I said, oh. 
I had to diagnose myself and I'll never forget. He put his hands down like this and he said, when is it gonna stop? He said, why does my patient always have to diagnose themselves with this oh. horrible disease? And I knew right then I was gonna get well. And he didn't hurry. We didn't, he did not do, he didn't rush me. He went through every single thing with me. He said, you have a very difficult case because we can't see your tumor. On the MRI. On the MRI, but I have tricks, you know? And I will, we will do whatever we can to get you better. And I said, and he said, we'll have to do a petrosal sinus sampling just to verify. So a petrosal sinus sampling is this very kind of, in, it's a little invasive where they go up through your growing with um, catheters and they inject you with um, CRH, I believe is the- so Is it a dye it's a, it's, it's, it's a hormone oh. to, to see, it, it will shut down the uh, oh, pituitary. Okay. Okay. So it will shut down the pituitary and they measure like over a period of time. Um, if you're, because, because if you have a, a tumor, it won't shut down and they can measure how much ACTH. If, the gland itself won't be working, but the tumor will well, work. So the tumor, even though it's it a doesn't tumor, respond. still work, does something. Yes, it won't respond to the hormone. It, because the tumor itself won't shut down when you, um, when, you're, when you have Cushing. So your gland shuts down and stops talking to your adrenal glands, but the tumor just keeps pumping out ACTH. And that's what causes all your symptoms. And that's what causes the symptoms. And, okay, mm -hmm. and that means you're getting What's, is that why you have high cortisol then? Yes. Okay. Because typically the way the, the pituitary talks to your adrenal glands is it, when the adrenal glands signal back, we have a lot of cortisol going, yeah. the ACTH Take will it. stop. So it, and stop talking, saying we need more, we need more. When you have a tumor, all it, you just keep feeding the adrenal glands more and more ACTH. Okay. And the it's adrenal getting, gland just has to- It's not getting the message. It's no message. Yeah. And the adrenal glands just have to keep going, okay, okay, we'll make more, we'll make more, we'll make more. And um, whereas like if the gland was talking to it, they would say, ah, we okay. got plenty okay. of, we got quite, plenty of cortisol, you will, we'll back off for a little bit. So, so the, the tumor is this kind of zombie yes, that just keeps thing. going. It keeps going. Just through, okay. All right. So, and the way our normal body works is, so cortisol for you or me now um, would be higher in the morning. And by, you know, three or four or five in the afternoon, it starts to taper off that, um, because you're going to go to sleep. Mm. So at midnight, you could test your uh, ACTH and have zero, mm. you know, one, zero. But then it starts to kick back in. It's your circonium rhythm. So you're... So this is why you were anxious at night. At night and didn't because sleep this, at night. Yeah. Because most patients, uh, most Cushing's patients kind of have a reverse now. So they're so much cortisol going in at night where they shouldn't have it. And in the morning, then they're exhausted because they haven't slept all day. And so they, because they just, and then there's some days that, you know, you, you, you can function, but so maybe your cortisol is not as high, but you still feel sick and you don't lose the symptoms. Um, but it, it, it can be waves of, okay. of this of hormonal burst and things like that. So when he saw you, he knew immediately. He knew immediately. That you had Cushing's. And Dr. Van Hurley, obviously yeah. Dr. Kelly, are, um, so Dr. Cohan and Van Hurley confirmed from their point of view mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I needed surgery. Mm -hmm. And then they saw, sent me to Dr. Kelly, okay. who trusts their diagnoses, but doesn't see a tumor. But he also knows that, you know, at least 30% of tumors with ACTH tumors are not seen on an MRI. It, the technology is a little better and they do a dynamic MRI now and things like that in my day. Uh, maybe we would have seen it now with the better, sure. a little better technology, but, in, but really my, the tumor was inside my gland. It wasn't on the outside, which makes it more difficult. And sometimes you can see a shadow when hmm. those kind of tumors, or maybe it's pressed a little bit in the glands, a little funny looking. So Dr. Kelly can tell that that's suspicious. Maybe that's where the tumor is. But definitely my petrosal sinus sampling came back that it was definitely pituitary source. Okay. Um, it was high on both sides. Sometimes it'll be high on one side of the gland and not on the other. And kind of give them an indication. Maybe that's where the tumor yeah, okay. is. But mine happened to be high on both sides. So, so it's, this so is it was, really high. It, it was a crapshoot, sort of. Yeah. So, um, so Dr. Cohan met me at the petrosal sinus sampling that day. That was the first day I met him. 
And what was interesting is I'm down alone, you know, and he comes and he says, Dr. Kelly wants me to introduce myself. I'm here to help you. And, and I'm thinking, Dr. Kelly's on vacation, you know, and here, here he is telling Dr. Cohen, I'm down here. And, to, and he said, and he said, you know, as soon as he gets back from vacation, we're going to make do everything we can to make you better, Charmin. I know you've had a bad time Ugh. up until this. And I'm thinking, huh? Nobody has After cared about this. me. And here this doctor is telling when he's on vacation. And another thing that Dr. Kelly had done when I was leaving that day, here he's got to go to surgery. But when I leaving that day, he says to me, you know, I just did a surgery uh, for another patient that had Cushing's and her, her husband is a colleague of mine. He's a doctor here at UCLA and he was actually an endocrinologist and she had Cushing's and she oh, was a nurse. Ironic. Yeah. And he said, would it help you if you if I called her and you had someone to be there for you with you? And because I'm alone doing all of this. And I said, yeah. And by the time I got home from L.A. For, to Orange County, 50 miles, he had already called her and I had already gotten a phone call from her. And Debbie was a really big support to me. And that kind of triggered me to say, I need to support other patients. I see. This really made a difference for me, you know, that this man cared enough to go call this woman right away. She called me, you know, she was there to support me. I'm going to support someone else. Yeah. And um, Dr. Cohan and I instantly bonded. I knew he was brilliant. He was young. He was an expert already on Cushing's training with Dr. Um, Van Hurley. And um, he's been my endocrinologist for 21 years and has helped me with more than just my endocrine care. He just, he's just brilliant. Mm. He just thinks outside the box. He works with Dr. Kelly still, you know, to now. Um, well, tell us about, so tell us about the surgery. Cause this is, that's the, that, when does that happen? So after, afterwards, this was a funny part of the story. So I'm really intuitive and I have a, a, a like a hyper intuitive sense. And it's, it's been good and bad in my life. You know, I don't read, you know, uh, people or anything, but it's for me, you know, it, it, I know things. And so I know my body really well. So I, I was meditating and I, and Dr. Kelly had said, it's going to be a tricky surgery. We know it's in the pituitary, but we can't see it. So I was meditating and I said, where is this tumor? I know I can find this tumor. And I started getting a pain on like the left front side of my head. And I'm like, ah, oh, that, and I, that's where the tumor is. So a friend of mine so says, left you can front front of the pituitary? Front of the pituitary, right in the middle. And so my friend Angela says, you cannot tell Dr. Kelly that story. He will think you're insane. I said, no, I have to tell him. I have to tell him where the tumor is. So he calls me before my surgery and he says, you know, we're getting ready to go to surgery. And I said, Dr. Kelly, please don't think I'm insane. I'm just very intuitive. I said, and I know the tumor is on the left front side, right in the middle. Now, any other doctor with an ego and all that would have said, okay, thanks for the info, but I'm the yeah. neurosurgeon. Yeah. You know, Dr. Kelly says to me, wow. That's, he said, the only place on your MRI that looks suspicious is the left front side right in the middle. And that's where I was planning to go first. Let's hope you're right. And I was like, I knew right then I that's, got peace. I knew without doubt. I must have gotten chills. I, I did. I was like, oh my God. Like if he wouldn't even have said that, I would have still been leery. Like it just confirmed exactly. I'm going to be well. This surgery is going to work. Yeah. So I go into surgery. I come out of surgery. Well, wait, did they do, how did they do oh, it? Oh, and they so they go trans, invasive? so they, in those your... days, we didn't have the endoscope like we have now. So he did microscope, but still he did uh, minimally invasive. Through your. Through my nostril. Mm -hmm. And with a microscope. And with a microscope. And, um, which was harder, you know, with, it, there was no ENT there like they do now, like Dr. Griffiths or anything. He, Dr. Kelly was the solo surgeon doing everything himself. So he yeah. goes in through the, through A nostril. Your, your nostril and then he has to break through the, the, um, well, they take the bone right out between the oh, two do. optic nerves. Okay. Yeah, they break and through there. With the tiny the medium little... medium, or whatever. So this tiny little microscope scope. is on a stick. 
Right. In those days, it wasn't really a stick because the endoscope, they came so far. Okay. So the endoscope, you're right. It goes up through the nostril and it there's a camera, uh, there is a light and it, it shows all this three dimensional okay. view and everything. Then? And then in those days, the microscope is still a very good source for tumors. Um, and there are some cases that Dr. Keller will still use a microscope, uh, probably not for pituitary anymore, but the, the microscope shows a two-dimensional view it doesn't go behind oh, corners okay, okay. and different things like that but it was still a good good a very good and, and gold standard at that time the endoscope hadn't came quite to be the gold yeah. standard at the time so he could get a really good view of my pituitary gland and what they do in the in the situation where they have they don't see the tumor um, they make tiny little incisions in the gland and they have these O-ring um, surgical tools. And he can tell you all that stuff because he, he's good with it. But they do, they make these little incisions that are not hurting the gland and they press on it with these, with these uh, tools and they're kind of a ring. And then the tumor just popped out. No kidding. Yeah. So he was able to go what? right where he, sus he suspected the tumor was, make these tiny little incisions, use this um, this O-ring uh, surgical tool and give it a little press and the tumor showed You're itself. You're kidding. And then what he did is he cleaned out that whole area, took just minor, minor parts yeah, of my yeah. gland. It, while I was still in surgery, he sent to pathology. Pathology said, we think you got all of it, but we might need to get a little bit of the corners. So he went back in, took a little bit more of the gland, came back out, and that was all. And my gland was totally intact. Um, then that, so I came out of um, surgery and I remember being in the um, recovery room and Dr. Kelly, Dr. Cohan, Dr. Van Hurley and some students. And I said, where was it, Dr. Kelly? And he said, right where you told me. And mm -hmm. everyone, I just remember hearing, oh, you know, and and then, so I went in and, and it's not good. After surgery, when they, when they actually get you into remission, you know, you feel lousy and that's what we want. Like we want you to feel bad because the worse you feel means your cortisol is gone. That tumor is gone. Because the cortisol jacks you up? Right. So when, when the tumor is removed and they've got all of it, yeah. they call it plummeting. Your, your hormones are going to plummet. And I think the study still shows that they want it, they want your ACTH and cortisol or ACTH to go below one and um, your cortisol levels to plummet to um, below, f I think four is the cutoff that they consider you And you again have been in at? Remission. I've been at 200. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so your body's just you're like a Changing. I always say to patients like it's kind of like it be in a drug addict where once you yeah, start to withdrawal, pull you off kinda. the withdrawals you you feel worse so a lot of patients don't understand like they think the minute the tumor's gone you feel great no we want you to feel bad because if you don't feel bad it, there's a they, chance you're really not in remission yeah and if you don't need steroid replacement you you're really not in remission and it's it's a it's a and the, eventually okay, so you, it starts you get to come and you back. feel lousy. You feel lousy. Emotionally lousy? Emotionally, physically lousy? You're, you're like a roller coaster. You're crying. I remember being my best friend, Karen, like was by my side. And she's looking at the nurses like, this is, what do we do with her? And, you know, and I'm like crying and this and, and, and you just, everything feels overwhelming. It's just, it, you feel like everything's to the ninth degree. And, um, and so, but that's a, Dr. Kelly's smiling because he's seeing he's this saying, behavior and going, oh, well, I'm pretty we sure it. we got the tumor, you know, and by the next so 20, we, they check your cortisol and your ACTH, you know, pretty regularly every three hours or so. And you can start to feel that your body, like I'm starting to get irritated and agitated and sweaty and not feeling, uh, you know, and I keep saying that means it's a good thing. It's a good thing, you know, and ends up that my cortisol levels with after a 24 hour period, about 28, 29 hours later, 
I plummeted. I my levels were down. But even before we got so the results, so for the first back, time in what seven, seven years, years, eight years, probably before that, uh, even we don't know. You you have normal cortisol levels. No, I have below. No, I have below, no, no. I have no Way cortisol. Below. Okay. Yeah, I have. That's I'm, quite. I'm, a, I'm, that's I'm like yeah, going cold turkey on something. Okay. Right. We we plummet, and that's. But they don't let you stay like that for long. Once the, you know, like even before we got the proof back in the uh, yeah. lab results. They started me on hormone replacement on steroids um, to get me uh, to stay alive. At that point, I don't make I'm not making any cortisol because my pituitary gland is completely asleep because it wasn't awake. It was letting the tumor do all the work. Okay. And now the tumor's gone. The gland is asleep. It takes a little while to wake up. Does it? It does come. It does wake up. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, if all goes well, it wakes up, but it it wakes up slowly. It doesn't wake up overnight um, because it's been sick for a very long oh time. Oh my god! Yeah. So now we've got to go on steroids, and steroids. Everyone always goes, "Oh, I don't want to be on steroids," but steroids when you need them and you aren't making any cortisol, they're keeping you alive. So basically, they're going to give you a replacement dose at first a little higher because you yeah. are a drug addict and you are going to feel that your cortisol is too low, even if they were giving you an appropriate amount because you've been high. So you need to kind of get to a point where you can tolerate a lower to mm. normal range. So the steroids, so that's where a good endocrinologist and a good, uh, a highly skilled person highly um, skilled pituitary neurosurgeon, one that does high volume, really comes into play because those are the doctors and the team that's going to know how to help you after surgery. Um, you know, a lot of hospitals that are not real high volume, um, even some that say they are, uh, they'll put a patient right into the uh, um, like um, critical care unit. Dr. Kelly doesn't need to put you typically into a critical care unit or anything. I mean, a normal, you know, they know yeah. how to, their team is very experienced. They know how to watch you. They're not going to let you crash and burn. You know, they, they start your steroid replacement appropriately. They get you stable. Um, and the endocrine team takes over. And Dr. Cohan had me, uh, very, watch me very, very closely on my steroid levels and how we, so we start off a little high by the time time they get me, you know, home and the next week, then we lower down to an appropriate level that um, may feel uncomfortable and my joints are going to hurt and I feel foggy and all the good things that we don't want to admit, but that means I'm in remission because that's, I'm going to heal from the inside out. Mm. So I um, have to remind patients, we don't feel good. Cushing's patients after surgery don't feel good for quite some time. Like what are we talking about? The first week or two, you're really tired and you're all emotional and things. And then you slowly start to get a little bit better. But it's a full 18 months, 18 months. for a healthy recovery where you start to look back and go, oh, my gosh, is this normal? Because you have to remember that patient was usually sick for a very long time. Normal has become not normal you know their normal oh, yeah. is no longer what what reality is so your body has adjusted and adjusted and adjusted to being sick so now that you get now that you're considered well and you're considered at normal um maybe hormone replacement level where you're um you you don't feel great but as your gland starts to wake up you keep testing all through throughout your recovery and within a good a good healthy time to have be off your steroid and your gland to have waken up is about 11 to 12 months. Um, anything over that, you might want to talk to your endocrinologist about like why your gland's not waking up. And typically it's because they're not with a very experienced doctor and they're not helping them to get to a point where their gland is waking up. It's mm. usually not because they had a, a bad surgery or something. But um, that, but even patients that stay on steroids too long after surgery, Dr. Cohan has had patients that he's gotten off um, steroids even after five years and things like that. Where um, and once my gland's completely healthy now, it took me from about April till November. I think I was almost completely off of steroids. Um, the 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 process towards the end is still not good. I remember calling Dr. Cohan when I was down to like maybe just two or three um, milligrams of prednisone, and I was crying and I said, "I can't do it. I I got to have more. I'm my mm. body hurts so bad and my head is pounding." 
And thank God for Dr. Cohan. He said, it's okay, Charmy. I don't want you to suffer. Um, but if we, if you can tolerate it a few more weeks, um, you're almost there. You know, you're almost off. Your gland is working. Your adrenal glands are working. We just have to start over, you know, if we, you if know, you and I said, up. okay, okay. But just to know that gave me that courage mm. and that strength to go, okay, I can do this. And um, sure enough, uh, by the time I got to just two milligrams, I didn't need it anymore. Mm. I could stop just fine. And now, is, are you off it completely now? Yes, it's been 21 years. Wow. And my gland has, um, my levels are um, always good. Uh, believe it or not, my ACTH has never came back to, like, so my range at the lab is uh, 10 to 60. And mine stays about seven or eight, my hmm. ACTH. But my cortisol is is normal and I function normal on that. Um, we can function on very little ACTH and cortisol. Our body is designed that way to really survive. It's our survival, you know, mm. hormone. So um, I feel good after 21 years that my levels have never came back up um, to over even un above normal, really. Mm. I think a couple of times we've tested it and it's been like maybe 20 or something, but then it goes back down, but I still feel fine. I still have plenty of cortisol. I'm making, my gland is working, you know, it's it's healthy. So um, I, I it makes me feel good that maybe this disease will never come back. I'll stay in remission um, because it can come back. Yeah, And a lot of patients don't stay in remission, but this is a really good sign. Yeah, that you're this that, far out. That I'm yeah. this far out. My levels have never jumped up or spiked or anything like that. And they've stayed very, very healthy. So, so just a couple final things. So this led to a huge partnership between you and Dr. Kelly. Yes, we're like family. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, in the beginning, in the early years, um, I had to learn a lot um, because I had to learn how doctors think. So um, not just how the patients. So I had plenty of contact with patients. And the thing that Dr. Kelly saw that a lot of doctors don't see is that I was a patient, but I um, and he can't be everything. He can hear what his colleagues say at conferences and he can read their published literature and all this. And he, But he's never going to hear the side of the story where maybe their patient isn't doing well or mm. they didn't help a patient. You know, he's never going to hear that side right. unless they ha are trying to teach someone and, right. and admit to their mistake or admit to their what they don't know. So what he saw with me was that I had eyes and ears across the country, across, you know, even over in other countries to see what was going on. And he was going to learn from me as much as I was going to learn from him. So that was the difference. And that's what there's a lot of doctors that just think, oh, she'll go, you know, she'll go out and talk to patients and bring in patients and things like that. But I don't have anything to learn from her. She's going to just Mm. No, I'm good and I'm great and I'm going to and bring me patience. Well, I'm not like that. So I have to believe in what I'm doing and I have to believe in the doctors I'm working with. And I have to believe that that I have to see the side behind the scenes. And I have to know without a doubt that what I'm putting my name on or my heart into they are doing the right things and that they are trying their their intention is for the patients and to better care for patients. Yeah. And I saw that with Dr. Kelly. He saw he saw in me that I was not a crazy person just going out and going to badmouth doctors and you know and t you know yes there was a lot of bad things that happened but but with that I learned a lot like how how do I make it better then? How do I point that out without without turning doctors against me just and just turning their you know like oh, I don't need that to say, oh, maybe I did miss it. Mm. Maybe I can learn something. Maybe I, maybe this will be on my radar next time, you know? And you, I learned that from Dr. Kelly, how to do it. How to do that. Did you go back to your doctors who missed this and say, hey, I just want to let you know, this is what I had in the end? Well, I wanted to go back in a very nasty way and like really point out to them like how they made the mistakes and how stupid they sure, were. Sure, I can imagine and, that. Would, I mean, you were like... <laughs> Because like, they're not stupid. That's the problem. That's what makes me angry. So, um, yes. Yeah, so Dr. Kelly convinced me the best way to do it was to let him write letters and to point out how they missed it. I agreed, <laughs> begrudgingly, but it was the best way to so do it. So he did it. He did. And then what I, how I taught them was I started getting in front of the media, writing articles, 
really becoming a patient advocate in the public eye. There had not been at that point too much of that done. No media work or anything like that. So I wanted to not sing to the choir to just patients that are sick. I wanted this to be in the media, what to the public. So what do we look for? What are we missing? How doctors are taught historically, this is very rare. We know pituitary disease is not rare. It's uncommon, Cushing's is uncommon, but it's not rare. So how do we raise that awareness? And, and that's through the public. And so my goal was there was some websites coming from patient advocate groups, but, but what I saw is I wanna get in front of the public. So I wrote articles and I did television and I got mm. in front of, as much media as I could. And that really started making doctors step it up, you know? And Dr. Kelly started teaching at conferences a little different. He and I would argue like, you know, how are you, you're saying this, but patients are feeling this. So he started combining things that I said to make sure when he was doing a conference that he was pointing out things that doctors didn't necessarily learn in medical school. Like, you know, what are, where's the gap? Mm. How do we fill in that gap between patient and actually yeah, well, what, yeah. medically? What, and he really does a good job with that. Um, it's not a perfect uh, scenario because some doctors just don't want to learn, you know, um, and patients still have a hard time getting a diagnosis. But I think from the work me and Dr. Kelly and a lot of advocate groups have done, it was, we've moved that golf ball one inch closer to the sun. We're not there yet, but we're close. So one wonders how many um, months or years you've shaved off the weight. A lot. That on a lot of patients. Cushing's patients are going through now. A lot. Because you had to go through this. Not all of it. Hellish. Hell. But uh, a lot of patients through. are getting diagnosed much sooner now. Is the, you think, you think the term Cushing's disease is, is probably much more in the popular now, culture. Yes. It's much more, people yes. are much more aware of it. Um, yep. But it's not, it, at least it's a conversation now. Whereas yeah. before, and a lot of patients are still getting dismissed. And they're still fighting. But the more we can have this conversation, the more the public can understand yeah. that um, the better it's going to be for everybody in the future. Yeah, that's fantastic. Sharon, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank uh, you. It's an incredible story. Um, and you know, I like to think that you made this journey uh, through the heart of darkness here so that others don't have to. With a team. Yeah. It takes a team. Dr. Yeah. Kelly and Dr. Cohan are my team. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for all you do.